Okay, so what we're gonna do here is we're actually gonna figure out what temperature this occurs at, okay? So again, here is going to be uh, the, the problem that we'll work through at sample problem 20.8. So I want you to think about this for a minute. I'm going to give you a few clues here as we uh, start beginning to work through this. But uh, again, we want to know what the temperature is at this process uh, that this process becomes spontaneous under. We know that the delta G is uh, positive 8.9. Okay, so at this point, we want to know at what temperature we need to increase the temperature to. At 25 degrees, it's not spontaneous. So what temperature do we need to increase it to in order to figure out what um, the, uh, the temperature is going to be? So think about this. How could we figure out what delta H and delta S are for this process? Okay. Give you again a hint, this is a process that we used before if we had a balanced chemical reaction that we could figure out delta H and delta S, maybe using something like uh, an appendix that has some values in it. So I'll give you a minute, uh, pause the video, try to see if you can work through this solution on your own. And if you need some help, just feel free, play the video and let the solution play out. So I know there's a lot here on this slide, but just highlighting what we have shown in gray here is stuff that we've already done. This is stuff that we've already, um, skills that we've already practiced, taking a balanced chemical equation, using delta H and uh, S values from uh, appendix B in order to determine what delta H and delta S of the reaction are. This last little piece here was just kind of a proof of concept to show that if you take those enthalpy and entropy values and you put them in this equation, you actually can solve for what delta G is and we do get with an experimental error the same value that's provided. But the reason that we did this was not to solve for what delta G is, it was to actually determine what delta H and delta S are because we need those uh, parameters in order to figure out what our pivot point is. So remember, this is our pivot point equation. When we take delta G equals delta H minus T delta S, and we want to go ahead and figure out what that pivot point is, we set delta G equal to zero, and then that's how we get delta H equals T delta S. Solving for T uh, is going to put delta H over delta S. Important here, make sure that you have things in the right units. So whether you convert your entropy to kilojoules, or in this case, we converted our enthalpy to joules. I usually mathematically find that to be an easier process um, to do. Then you go ahead and solve and you'll get a temperature in Kelvin. Keep in mind, sometimes a problem might ask for the temperature in centigrade. So you'll have to do that conversion back from Kelvin to Celsius. But again, we can see we knew that we were going to have to increase the temperature here, okay, right? We knew we had a process where entropy was helping us, so we wanted to increase the temperature. And this little plot here is going to just kind of highlight what's going on here. The colder we get here, the more non-spontaneous that process becomes. So as we heat up this process, we become more spontaneous, okay? And what we just did in this problem was solve for that pivot point, solve for that temperature, and it's just below 80 degrees Celsius. So in our first problem here, we're looking at a molecular scene that highlights this generic chemical reaction. We've got A2, which is represented by these two black spheres, this diatomic gas, B2, which is this green diatomic gas. These two molecules react to make two molecules of AB which is represented by, again, a green and a black uh, sphere together. So they tell us that this is a spontaneous process, so delta G equals minus 3.4 kilojoules per mole. So the first problem asks us if the mixture that they show us in one is at equilibrium, calculate what K is. So this problem actually is not any different from things that we've done before. So why don't you go ahead, try to work through that problem, try to solve for what K is, if we know that reaction mixture one is at equilibrium. Okay, so remember, in order to figure out um, things with molecular scene problems, that usually involves counting, right? So here's, I've gotten written under each molecular scene here, what the concentration is of each species. So. Highlighting here, each molecule represents 0.1 atmosphere. 
So each time we see one of these, it represents 0.1 atmosphere. So if we've got two of them, we've got two of these guys, that means that the partial pressure of that gas is 0.2 atmosphere. Same thing for two greens that we see here, and then we've got four of these guys, one, two, three, and four. So that's why that one's 0.4 atmosphere. This is the one that they tell us is at equilibrium. So if I write an equilibrium expression, it's gonna be the partial pressure of AB squared divided by the partial pressure of A2 times the partial pressure of B2. So I'm just putting these values in to my equilibrium expression and solving for K. And for this particular problem, K is equal to 4.0. Okay, so we've had problems like this before where it was a, hey, equilibrium. If this is at equilibrium, where are these guys at? So we need to do the same sort of calculations for these guys, counting up molecules, figuring out how that relates to partial pressures. And now since we know these guys aren't at equilibrium, we're actually putting those values into the same equilibrium expression, but it's gonna be solving for Q, right? So we can use essentially the same expression, but now because these are non-equilibrium uh, conditions, we're solving for Q. So for our second molecular scene, Q is equal to 0.44. So Q is less than K, so we are before our equilibrium. In our third molecular scene here, Q is equal to 36. We've actually gone past our equilibrium. So in this case, we're going to have to turn around and come back. There's actually another problem here that asks us to think about what it means to be at standard state. So again, what we're doing here is working through the second part of the problem here, evaluating the delta G values for the second and third mixtures as well as for what's at standard state here. So again, we've just figured out sort of what the Q values are for these guys. Again, if we figure out if everything's at one atmosphere, putting all of the ones into this expression solves and gets a Q equal to one. So in that case, putting things at standard state, which means everything's at one atmosphere, for this situation also means we are before our equilibrium. All right, last problem here has us think about the same kind of a situation, but now thinking about just doing some math with it. So here's our problem that we have here. We want to calculate K at two different temperatures, okay? They give us the delta G of both of these temperatures, and let me actually go and highlight here. I've got to fix one of these numbers. This number here is actually not 212, but minus 12. So let me go ahead and fix that one right now. So that's what that number is. So we want to go ahead and calculate what K is at both of these different temperatures when they give us delta Gs, okay? So they give us um, delta G values for the two different temperatures, okay? So I'm gonna give you a little bit of a hint here. Let's think about some of the things that we know. So again, the delta G for this process at 298 is minus 141.6, and it becomes less spontaneous as we increase temperature. That's something we've seen before. When it becomes less spontaneous as we increase temperature, that must mean that entropy is not helping us. Entropy is a losing component in this process. So delta S must be negative. So some of the qualitative questions I could ask about a problem like this is to actually think about what's going on from an entropy standpoint. We could have predicted that too, right? Looking at this, we've got three moles of gas going to two moles of gas. And are more molecules moving more sort of scenario? This is fewer molecules, right? So that's gonna be unfavorable from an entropy standpoint. Unfavorable entropy is negative. Okay, so that was kind of a review of some conceptual things that we've talked about, but if we want to just do this problem and we want to calculate K, what we need to do is we need to take our equation, delta G equals minus RT ln of K, and we need to solve for K. If you need some help with this algebra, make sure to reach out sort of uh, uh, offline here. But we need to take E to the both sides in order to isolate our K. Okay, so that's going to allow us to get K is equal to E to the minus delta G over RT. So what we're going to do is we're going to solve for minus delta G over RT, take E to that, and then that'll get us to K. So try working through that on your own. See if you can get those values, okay? And then uh, continue playing the video to check your work. 
All right, so I've done this in two different colors just to clearly highlight the one that's done at 298 and then the one at 973. Going through the math, we can get that that delta G minus delta G over RT term is gonna be equal to positive 57.2. E to the 57.2 is a very large number, seven times 10 to the 24th, essentially meaning we're gonna have almost 100% products. This is a super spontaneous process, largely favoring products, as we can see with this equilibrium constant. When we're at 973, it's still a spontaneous process, okay? But now we're barely on the product side. Our K is not very large, okay? So barely on the product side there. Okay, so hopefully that's pretty straightforward for you guys to see those numbers. The last little piece we're gonna work through here is thinking about kind of equilibrium shifting. So this is again a Q versus K comparison. So they tell us that we've got two containers that are filled with gas. One we're gonna keep at 25, one we're gonna keep at 700. And keep in mind 25 is 298, 700 is 973. So we're gonna keep two containers of gases and they've told, told us the amount of gas that they put in there. We wanna know Will any of these, or which direction, if any, will these reactions proceed to reach equilibrium? So again, give you a hint here. This is a Q versus K comparison. We just solve for what our Ks are at these two different temperatures. So let's figure out what our Q is. And for each of these situations, figure out which way we have to shift. So try working through that problem. Pause the video, and when you're ready to check your answer, press play. All right, so just putting into our equilibrium expression, the concentrations that they give us, and again, they're given as partial pressures, we get that Q is equal to four. So in our first situation, if Q is equal to four, that's much less than our very large K that we solved for at 298. So that reaction is gonna to proceed to the right, and we're gonna make a lot of product. When we see our situation here at 973, K was equal to 4.5. So in this case, Q is almost equal to K. We're a little bit less than K, so we still are gonna to shift to the right, but it's gonna be a very slight shift to the right. We're gonna make just a tiny bit more product, but not that much. All right, so wrapping up chapter 20, our, our uh, last lecture here on thermodynamics. Right, We're dealing with spontaneity with delta G. So we did a lot thinking about kind of um, spontaneity in different directions and we talked about this qualitatively last lecture with melting ice or freezing water and did our win-lose sort of comparison to think about the fact that at some point we do have a pivot point here we do have a temperature dependence of either melting ice or freezing water clearly we know that and we know that the pivot point is zero degrees C but we learned in today's lecture how we can solve for what that temperature is and then lastly, we did um, uh, connect some previous concepts, thinking about some, sort of a Q versus K comparison, right? So thinking about tying together equilibrium and spontaneity. So when we are not at equilibrium, we are going to have a reaction that's spontaneous. We're either going to keep moving in the forward direction to be spontaneous, or we may need to reverse the reaction in order to be spontaneous. So again, how far we are away from K, how the magnitude of the difference between Q and K will be reflected in the magnitude of delta G. And again, we can calculate some of these parameters using two sort of important equations. One that we didn't spend a lot of time with today, uh, so don't worry about it too much. There was one extra problem that we could have worked through, and this is how we deal with non-standard conditions. But just a topic that I chose to eliminate for um, for this learning unit. But this is an important equation I want you to know, um, or at least know how to use. You won't need to know it, it'll be provided for you, but it's an important equation that allows us to relate thermodynamics and spontaneity with equilibrium and reaction shifting. Okay, so a kind of a little bit more of a dense lecture to sort of wrap up our thermodynamics unit, but hopefully um, uh, we'll be able to answer any questions you might have in our in-class session.